you know, the essence of communication is, is not just the words on a page, but the visual impact of it. So that the cartoons and the covers and the illustrations of the rag probably had more impact on our readers in changing the consciousness than you know, any of the words we said, which often were really you know, poorly crafted or, you know, or naive or, or <laughs> wrong. But the images really did articulate the, the sentiment, the, the look, the presence of the rag. That defined you know, what we were doing there. There were so many artists, so many people willing to, to make things for the rag. The whole environment of Austin was filled with art and music and, and they got incorporated into the uh, rag. And it was just because that's the way the people were. You weren't even thinking about it, you know, just, hey, I'll draw this for you. It'll be in the paper. That's kind of cool. I can see my work in the rag. That was its own reward, pretty much. That was it. I submitted the first cover February 20th, 1967. Basically, I would just kind of submit something or bring it in and give it to them, and they would run it. It was pretty much that easy. I think Gilbert Shelton was the first to ever draw at Willie, and then uh, Jim Franklin was the one that kind of picked up on it and did a lot of Oat Willie stuff. And by the time I got down to drawing Oat Willie, he was a store, you know? <laughs> he was a logo like Colonel Sanders for KFC. You know, it was like, right on. <laughs> In the downstairs office at the old University Y building, they would lock the front doors and after 10 o'clock you had to come in through a window. You had to crawl under this huge loquat bush so you're coming down through a window onto a table into the room and somewhere after the Vulcan had closed down that night at one or two in the morning the window would open and here would come Jim Franklin in a peacoat redolent of herbs and mainly patchouli and he would have wrapped up the uh, Vulcan ad or on special occasions he would have a cover art or centerfold art and that was always a big highlight of the evening. You know one of the things that fueled my uh, my enthusiasm about doing this kind of stuff, the artwork, was the, the fact that Texas was the surrealist state of the Union. It based its entire reputation on exaggeration, lying, you know, absolute bullshit. And that was so much fun that it was an, a, a perfect uh, state to, for someone like with a twisted mind like mine to to come in and play around. They wanted a, a cartoon map of Austin and where all the happening things are for the new students in town. And uh, I didn't want to draw that. I, so I drew an, an aerial view of Austin with these giant armadillos and they're, they're, they're going about what they do. They dig around in the ground looking for worms and grubs and things. So I would put a, an, an object above each one of them. One of them had a can opener and the other one had a, a, a screwdriver, like tools, you know, because armadillos kind of invoke a, a, an idea of, of utility and, and machine and all that stuff, you know, they're a toolish animal. <laughs> one of the things that I was determined not to do was to do the, the Mickey Mouse uh, trip, you know. Um, in fact, I did that first drawing as an armadillo has come across a matchbox with uh, uh, some pot in it, which was a measuring sales device at the time. Five bucks would get you a matchbox. And there was some paper, a packet of papers and a couple of rolled joints and the armadillo's puffing on one of them. And it's a realistic, it's not a, a cartoon armadillo, it's a realistic rendering of that painting. That, and uh, that connected. I mean, the audience immediately got it. That was us. We were definitely pushing a point of view of sort of leftist politics and just economics and anti-war. But there was, a, there was a sense in which we were trying to get people to think for themselves. And, we, and, and some people, and I recall Judy Smith being one of them, saying, well, we didn't want to be an opinion leader. We just wanted to put stuff out there so people would come to their own conclusions but not tell them how to think because we didn't want people telling us how to think. People would get to know through the rag what was going on in different arenas in Austin, like with music and with uh, the Greenbrier School and what was going on politically locally but also nationally. and something for people to talk about so it built a sense of community. 
And building a sense of community is the way you do collective action. You know, they call it counterculture because that's what it was. I mean, we were creating a new culture. We were creating a new sense of identity. We were creating new art. We were creating new music. We were creating new ways of personal relationships. You know what it was? It was more like a hive mind. It's not like some person decided to do something and then got other people to go along with them. It was more like there was an idea here, sprung an idea there, we all talked about it, somebody else had an idea, it all sort of, it was like a group thing. So the ideas were just floating around. It was like, we didn't know the term then, but there was a culture of memes, these cultural ideas that were, in, that were jumping from mind to mind and, and morphing and coming to some coherent statement. We, the leftist students, took over Precinct 338, which was the central Austin precinct. In one dorm, one of those big freshman dorms over there, the vote was like 975 to 19, all right? And there were two of these precincts. <laughs> it was actually the governor's precinct until we uh, sent him home from a precinct meeting because he had failed to bring evidence that he'd voted in the Democratic primary. And at that, that was Governor Preston Smith, and at that time he moved his voter registration uh, back to uh, Lubbock or wherever he had come from because he found it humiliating to get thrown out of his own precinct convention. But we felt that from his political views it was difficult to tell that he was a Democrat rather than a Republican. By the mid-70s, you know, the student vote, there was no way. Every reactionary could not figure out what to do about this. We were now like 25% of the total vote, and we were delivering like 90% majorities, and we got rid of all of the reactionaries. Uh, the first resolution we passed after it became apparent that we had the numbers in the precinct convention was U.S. out of Angola, Mozambique, and Guinea-Bissau. And these people who had run the precinct forever were sitting there looking at each other, where the hell is Mozambique? And of course, anybody who'd been reading the rag for the last couple of years would have known that there was this colonial war that was being fought against Portugal and the United States was backing Portugal and, and it was a big deal and we had made a big deal of it. One of the big moves that the rag made was to start covering the city council because the Austin American didn't really. No one really covered what was going on at the city council. And a succession of RAG staffers, uh, I know Peter Davis and Bill Meacham, and then towards the end, Jim Rock, different people, whoever wanted to or who could stand it, <laughs> at these interminable meetings at this you know, like bureaucratic speak that was going on. I went to city council meetings and came back and wrote up my observations and opinions. And there was no clear demarcation between objective reporting and opinions. It was all sort of put in together because we were against the, the, the so-called objective journalism was actually just a voice for corporate domination, we thought. So we would have no qualms about saying, well, so-and-so said this and we think he's a jerk. And the RAG did a darn good job, really, first rate. I mean, s some of the people would, would talk to the players and they, they got to understand uh, how the different city bureaucracies worked and, and, and knew who was really going to be the recipient of uh, the largest of whatever was going on and, and who was being screwed. And, uh, and again, we, we shamed the Austin American statesmen into covering the city council. Politics in Austin is, is in some ways it's a cool spectator sport, you know, you're like, and it's always been that way, but we had, we made it more of a public spectacle than it was, and that was good. Because of my involvement with the RAG, I was aware of who was on the city council, and one of the city council members was a Dr. Bud Dryden, 
and he so adamantly stated that as long as he was on the city council, there would be no abortions at Brackenridge. I just couldn't let it ride. So much to everyone's surprise, I said, well, I'm going to run against Bud Dryden. And as we got deeper into this, realized that there were many issues involved, uh, issues of mass transit, uh, sewer, uh, environmental issues, how the whole concept of Austin growing was going to be managed and who was going to manage it. So it became a very exciting time for me personally. I had lots of space in the rag to write things. They even managed to put on what was called Beans for Bird Song. That was a wonderful fundraiser. It was fun. It raised money. It helped us to have TV ads and uh, even ads in the newspaper. I almost won. I, I think it came out that I had close to 48% of the vote. And I feel so lucky that I dodged that bullet of being a politician. The RAG always struggled. The goal was not to make money. No one ever made any money off of the RAG. Uh, but uh, everybody just enjoyed working there. And we always found a way to get the publication out. Money came from advertising and from the news racks. Uh, and there were, uh, there were some big ads occasionally would come in. We weren't very good at selling ads, and we were, at times we were even worse at collecting on ads. I remember that we had uh, a, one of our best ad customers back then was an uh, ice cream shop called Nothing Strikes Back. We ran ads for them for about six months without collecting. I remember going and uh, telling the owner that whatever, I mean back then a couple hundred dollars was a lot of, was a lot of money, telling him that he owed for a lot of rags and he just, he just couldn't pay it. So I think rather than being aggressive about collecting, I think what we said is, well, let's run a free ad for you and then we'll start all over again and, and then you can, you can pay, pay anew. At the time, you could form a student group and you, could, you were then allowed to show movies. Uh, Jerry and some of the others uh, formed a couple of groups. One was UT Students for Nixon and Agnew. And what those groups did was they showed porn movies. And I remember the first two porn movies that were shown were Behind the Green Door and Sodom and Gomorrah. When Behind the Green Door was, was, uh, was shown, and I, and I remember the issue that it was advertised on because we bought the back cover of the rag and we had uh, uh, an ad for Behind the Green Door. The front cover was a, uh, about a feminist article in the RAG criticizing Gloria Steinem. So it was a good juxtaposition, but we had, uh, we had showings in uh, Bats Auditorium. We sold out just about every show, and I believe we made about ten dollars to $12,000. And I know there was a lot of controversy about whether this was ill-gotten money. We had a big debate on pornography and its oppression of women. And we laid all of that out in the rag, pro, con, uh, and debated all that. It was a, a feeling that, well, how can we use that money to atone for the sin, sins of how it was raised? And uh, one of the things we did, I think there was a press, it was some women's press, I don't know if it was Red River, women's press, they, had, they needed a camera, and we bought a camera for that, and we made a lot of other donations. The Economy Furniture was out near 183 in Burnett Road. They had a largely Chicano workforce. They voted by a 252 to 83 vote in 1968 to form an Upholsterers International Union. And Milton Smith, the owner, refused to acknowledge the union. And the RAG covered this in really exhaustive detail. This organization got started called Students for Strikers. These students who went out and got involved with the upholstery workers brought them to the campus and got the Chicano students all interested in it and it became a movement. It was brutally hot. Being on a picket line all day must have been uh, an extremely exhausting affair and so that was really good to have these university kids out there helping these Chicano workers. For a long time there, we had as many students out on the picket line uh, as they had workers. And we were doing these benefits to try to keep the strikers going because Milton Smith was 
playing fast and loose with the labor laws and doing all the delaying he could and trying to starve them out, essentially. And they eventually won their struggle. But I do believe that the rag was significant in helping uh, to get solidarity for that uh, particular event and uh, help them win. I became a bit of a, an artist in using the RAG as an organizing tool. Polaroid Corporation was making a piece of technology called the ID2 that was used to make the passes to enforce the apartheid laws in South Africa. And there was a grassroots effort to use consumers in the United States to put pressure on Polaroid to get them to withdraw their technology from the, the use of enforcing apartheid. And in spite of the fact that we not only got no support from the Daily Texan, but active opposition from the Daily Texan, no editorials, no news coverage, we got the co-op to cease promoting Polaroid products uh, based on the rag and a bunch of leafleting. In 1975, in the summer, farm workers went out on strike in the valley and the student movement and the community around the RAG began to write about it and I began to follow that and uh, they needed support and the farm workers were out on strike and there were calls from the faith community, I know the Unitarians were involved, I know the Quakers were involved and they would uh, come to us and ask our support so we would write about you know that the farm workers need our help they need food and they need clothing and they need support they need finances because they're out on strike and they have no strike fund and these uh, they're under threat of you know basically terrorism a threat of being shot and so we organized a whole strike support committee in, in part out of the rag There was this huge Latin American studies program here and there were so many political refugees, there were so many people who came through this city. Um, there was such a wealth of, of, of information about the struggles that were going on in Latin America. Because remember, we believed that the vanguard of the revolution were going to be those third world struggles. All these people getting trained for the State Department or the CIA and that was the kind of garbage that they were teaching in the, in the Latin American Studies Department. So we had this whole other stream of people coming through who were actual participants in struggles. We helped put together an organization called the Latin America Policy Alternatives Group. A group of us that wanted to do a little bit more active outreach started a news program that was broadcast on KUT um, every week where we would take some of the key stories from the Latin America press and, uh, and read them and give some commentary. We actually got into trouble with the university after the, the coup in Chile uh, because our coverage was so, so critical of, uh, of U.S. policy that they, they called us in and said, listen, we can't continue to do it this way. And so we tried to moderate the, the coverage, but eventually they, you know, they took the show away from us. We ran a third world film series, brought a lot of films from Latin America to show here, and the RAG always covered the, the, uh, the rallies and the, and the initiatives that we took and did reviews of the films and the film series. We would organize benefits to support victims of repression in Latin America and you know the RAG was always consistently helping us get the word out. I think the RAG is like the movement. It's the idea that you can make history, that you don't need to wait around for the next election. Uh, you can create something that will change people, change opinions, build a community, build a social movement. And I think one, one, of, the, one of the most common statements that I've heard is people talking about how the RAG experience changed their lives, changed me. So here was a sense that we were really changing the world that this was serious, nobody had done this, what we were doing before. And many of us, including myself, absolutely believe the revolution, whatever that is, couldn't be more than a couple of years away. And we were trying to show and show people, exhort people, you know, we were good about making 
speeches and waving flags and stuff, and also to live our own selves, a, a way of life that was more human, um, more beneficial for all concerned, more full of love and peace. Uh, and I had friends who were, you know, who were straight, right? You know, they were student government types or just average people. Uh, and what they knew of the politics and the war and the issues, that came from the RAG. I am a believer, and I make this case, that um, our work at the RAG and at the other anti-war activities actually was very influential in stopping the Vietnam War. And I'm proud of that. It also redefined the whole concept of journalism. You know, the Austin Chronicle just wrote about it. it RAG is a precursor to a whole realm of publications, uh, the weeklies, the Chronicle, and there's papers like that all across the country. The empowerment of the RAG, uh, realizing that we could present our own news in our own way, that we didn't have to rely on somebody else's estimates of how many people turned up for the demonstration. You know, we could print our own. It was a defining moment because, you know, the path, no matter which way, they, people have gone in many directions, but you can trace back, you know, the path they took to the choices they made here. Because the rightness of what we were doing and the wrongness of how we perceived was ha what was happening in the world was so clear cut. The thing that is sort of astonishing and, and, and wonderful to me is how true people have stayed to their convictions. Uh, I mean, people are still out there doing incredibly uh, creative and brave and uh, innovative things to improve the lot of people around them. And uh, so that gives me a lot of hope and it also makes me think well we did something right back then you know it's it stayed true it's been like lodestone it, it's kept us all going in the same direction